Tom Brady is going to have significant restrictions placed on him as a broadcaster as long as he is pursuing a minority stake in the Las Vegas Raiders. We're also getting an inside look at how NFL teams are valued, and Stephen Curry signed a record extension. It's Friday, August 30th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. In this episode, I speak with our newsletter writer, David Rumsey, on the restrictions placed on Tom Brady, and if they mean he will ultimately have to choose between being a broadcaster or team owner. Forbes data analyst Justin Teitelbaum joins to discuss how the publication determines the value of teams and why the Cowboys are worth over $10 billion. We'll also check in with our multimedia reporter, Daryl Barnes, on what is causing a stir in sports social media. And we'll try to put Steph Curry's record-breaking deal in perspective. First, let's hit some headlines. The U.S. Open and ESPN are sticking together for the foreseeable future, even beyond that, actually. Wednesday afternoon, the two parties closed a deal to keep the tennis tournament on Disney's airwaves for the next 12 years. According to The Athletic, the deal is for just over $2 billion. ESPN is now the home to three of tennis's Grand Slams, pairing the U.S. Open with the Australian Open and Wimbledon. The U.S. Open is currently underway in Queens and will conclude on Sunday, September 8th. Colorado is accusing Oregon of hacking football data prior to the Buffalo's 42-6 loss last season, their first under head coach Deion Sanders. Following the defeat, Sanders contacted the Pac-12 to allege unauthorized access to Catapult, the team's replay system. The claim was thoroughly investigated, but no securities violations were found. Colorado opened its second season under Sanders and first season in the Big 12 against North Dakota State last night. The slow death of RSNs is changing the broadcasting landscape as we know it. The latest change comes in a new partnership between MSG and the Yes Network to create the Gotham Sports app. This joint venture streaming app will feature broadcasts for seven regional teams in one place, including the Knicks, Rangers, Yankees, and Nets. The combo package will cost $360 per year or 42 month to month. Shohei Otani is signing an exclusive trading card deal with Tops that includes autographs, game used memorabilia, and cards centered around moments and achievements. Tops is under the Fanatics umbrella, and Otani signed his first deal with the company in 2017 while he was playing for the Angels, although that did not include baseball cards. Two MVPs later, he's even more valuable to Fanatics, who said, You've got to have this guy in product. You've got to have his autographs and memorabilia for fans to chase. The value of the deal has not been released. Tom Brady is pivoting to his post-football career, but that still involves plenty of football. Not only is Brady joining the broadcast booth for Fox this upcoming season, he's also looking to buy a stake in the Las Vegas Raiders. But based on a Tuesday report, it seems like those ventures could be mutually exclusive, at least to a certain extent. The NFL told ESPN that Brady would have significant restrictions placed on his media accessibility as long as he's pursuing a stake. My colleague David Rumsey joins the show to explain why Brady is trapped between a $375 million Fox deal and his dream of team ownership. I'm joined now by front office sports newsletter writer, David Rumsey. Welcome, David. Hey, Owen. Hey, great to have you on. So the NFL came out with its rules for Tom Brady because he is a broadcaster with Fox and also is attempting to become a minority owner of the Las Vegas Raiders. So what is the NFL saying he cannot do in his broadcaster role? Yeah, so even before Tom Brady is potentially approved as a minority owner of the Las Vegas Raiders, he is going to have some key uh, things taken away from him that most game analysts get to partake in, particularly production meetings uh, before games and uh, viewing teams' practices, which if you listen to Troy Aikman or Tony Romo or whoever, Chris Collinsworth throughout the week, I mean, if you're listening to a game, they regularly call back to these things where they say, oh, yeah, we saw Mahomes doing this in practice or, you know, Sean Payton told us this in the meeting. Tom Brady is not going to get to do any of that, it sounds like, as long as he's trying to become a minority owner of the Raiders, and definitely if he does become one. Right. And so, yeah, the league's putting, it's from most reports, the league putting these restrictions in place right now because, you know, theoretically he could, you know, gather a bunch of information about every team in right. September and then uh, become a minority owner in October and still have that information to pass on to the Raiders. Um So how much do you think this restricts him as a a broadcaster? I mean, is he, you know, kind of playing with one hand behind his back here? Well, it will be interesting to see because this is certainly a departure from the norm. But I think uh, sports media and and broadcasting is changing in general. I mean, Brady just retired right after the 2022 season and he took a year off and is coming out. Um, Obviously, everybody thinks he's probably going to be very well equipped to give his opinion, but that's really what it's going to be now is just his opinion and his take on the game and not kind of this 
inside sourcing or going behind the scenes with uh, the quarterbacks and, and the head coaches and the key players. If, if anybody can do it, I, I would say Tom Brady is probably very well qualified to do that, but it's going to be a lot different than things have been in the past. I also wonder to what degree this is actually going to prevent him from having all this information, because presumably the rest of his broadcast team is going to be, you know, having all these conversations, having all this access, you know, can't, obviously it's not quite the same as him being there in person, but can't they then just say, you know, here's what Mahomes and the chiefs are, are like working on for this week and, you know, et cetera. Um, I'm wondering if the conflict of interest stuff, this is supposed to avoid is still in place here to some degree. Yeah, it's, it's a good point. His, his partner, Kevin Burkhart, if he's in these production meetings or watching a team's practice, you know, certainly he'll relay any important information to Brady. And, you know, like you said, Brady could potentially use that uh, down the road. I mean, we're kind of, you know, putting our tinfoil hat on here for potential controversies uh, down the road. But, you know, uh, it, it's, it's hard to say, right? Because it's not like these broadcasters are going in and getting all kinds of secretive information from these teams and their, these coaches and players, right? They certainly do get some stuff that they probably don't use and maybe some off the record or on background information throughout the week. And But, you know, these meetings, these production meetings and letting them watch practices are so they can have information to talk about during the game broadcast, which the entire country and 30 million people watching get to hear, right? So it's, it's not like we're talking about, you know, nuclear codes here, but it certainly is some uh, sensitive information potentially. At least half of what's at stake here is just the perception of Correct. if if something's awry here. Like if some team pulls some weird trick play and the Raiders just happen to be totally ready for it or just handle it really well, um, you know, or and you know, Fox has the broadcast. Yeah. You know, are people going to say like, oh, of course, like the Raiders knew that was coming, like even if Tom Brady had nothing to do with it, the league just doesn't want anything that looks kind of shady like that. Um, and sort of interestingly, these two obviously just can't get away from each other. There's precedent here uh, from the guy that Brady bumped from the top job. Right. Uh, Greg Olson, he, he did a uh, game broadcast back when he was uh, still playing for the Carolina Panthers. Uh, it was their bye week. Uh, it's back 2017 or 2018 or so, and uh, it was he called a game that the in, involving the Minnesota Vikings uh, that was playing on Fox, and coincidentally the Panthers were playing the Vikings later that season, and the Vikings are not happy that Greg Olson was going to be broadcasting their game and potentially getting some inside information. So he was it faced some of these same restrictions. He didn't get to go to the production meeting or watch practice, which that. That seemed, you know, very reasonable at the time. You know, a player, a team that they're going to be competing against. Uh, but yeah, I guess uh, Tom could uh, go ask uh, Greg how he prepared uh, for that week. Uh, one of his little colleagues there. Yeah, definitely. Um, do you think ultimately Brady is going to have to choose one or the other? Like, you know, that these restrictions are just going to be too much of an impediment to like really be the guy that Fox is paying him to be. Yeah, that's, it's interesting that you say that. Uh, Fox is paying him a lot of money, right? We all saw the numbers, a 10-year, $375 million contract um, that, you know, I think a lot of uh, people in sports media, including our own expert at front office sports, Michael McCarthy, think that Brady is probably not going to stay at Fox for that length of that 10-year contract. But, you know, we'll see. Uh, it, it does make things difficult, right? Uh, Fox is paying him as the highest paid game analyst, and then some in the NFL or really in all of sports. Um, he's not going to be able to you know, do the basic things like go to a production meeting. Maybe they've talked about this. Maybe they talked about this all along and they're fine with it. But yeah, it would seem that the owners are maybe saying, sending a message like, hey, you want to be an owner of a uh, minority owner of the Raiders? Uh, how about you don't be a game broadcaster? Or you want to be a game pro broadcaster? How about you don't be an owner? I think that's kind of a read you could take on this, but it seems like things are moving forward. And if they're getting serious about these restrictions, then maybe everybody is serious about making it happen. Right. And, you know, these restrictions in part could be for the owners who have to, you know, 24 of them will have to vote to approve Brady right. possibly in October. So we'll see if it's enough for them. David Rumsey, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks, Owen. Apple has refreshed its sports app ahead of the NFL season to add game tracking features for NFL and college football games. The app is taking a step toward other score tracking offerings by providing live play and drive info. 
The initial rollout of Apple Sports focused on simplicity, but as it heads into its first football season, the app is adding on a few more bells and whistles. The sports app also hints that Apple is ready to integrate sports betting at some point. When you tap on a game, you will see betting line info, whether or not you want it or are even in a state that allows legal sports betting. Similarly, the granular odds of different plays happening that Apple used for Friday Night Baseball weren't directly tied to betting options, but seemed to suggest that you might have an edge if you did, which you wouldn't, by the way. Those odds often made little sense. Apple isn't in the sports betting business, but they seem to be quietly laying the groundwork to make a move there at some point. For the second consecutive year, the Browns have restructured the $230 million contract of QB Deshaun Watson. Last year, the team converted all but $1 million of his $45 million salary into a signing bonus to get further under the cap. In exchange, they added a void year in 2027 and punted the cap hit forward a year. They have done the same this season, converting $44.75 million into a signing bonus. His cap hit this year was originally $64 million. Instead, it will only be $20 million. The move gives the team flexibility for short-term acquisitions. However, it makes Watson essentially impossible to trade or cut. If he was cut, the contract would carry an absurd dead money cap charge of $173 million. Since the Browns gave him a guaranteed $230 million, he missed 11 games due to a suspension in his first year and another 11 due to injury the second year. If things don't turn around in the next three years, this will likely go down as the worst contract given out by a team in NFL history. Private equity is not just coming for NFL teams and every other major league. A recent Bloomberg report finds that it's also coming for youth sports. The reason is simple enough. A 2022 study found that families spent $30 billion on youth sports between equipment, lessons, academies, and more. But investing in that industry requires consolidation by major firms. And so investment is going to change both how the industry operates and how kids play. The upsell for parents is going to be around getting more serious, more expensive coaches and gear. And if your kid is truly serious about sports, then that's great. But let's make sure there's still space for kids who aren't even interested in the junior varsity team at their middle school to run around and have fun and play sports in a way that is fun and accessible and meaningful to them. Let kids be kids. Forbes just came out with its latest list of NFL valuations topped by the Dallas Cowboys at $10.1 billion. I spoke to Justin Teitelbaum, who helped assess America's most popular league about what makes a sports team valuable, and that conversation is next. I'm joined now by Justin Teitelbaum, sports data analyst at Forbes. Welcome, Justin. Thank you for having me. Great to have you on. So Forbes just published its annual list of NFL team values, which ranges from the Cowboys at $10.1 billion down to the Bengals at $4.1 billion, which is still not a small amount. Um, I wanted to start with what we're talking about when, we, you know, when you put out these numbers. Is this um, essentially a prediction, a guess at if these teams were sold today, what the price would be? Yeah. So we're, we're really just trying to get a sense of where the teams stand if they were to be put on the market. And we obviously take into account recent team sales. So for example, last year's list had the commanders valued at 6.05 billion because that's what they were sold for. We, we take any market transactions into account. Uh, even you know, limited partner sales, if they're to occur, we look at those to try to determine what a controlling stake in the team would potentially go for. But yes, essentially, these are just our estimations of what the teams would be worth if they were to be put on the market. Yeah. And I want to get into the methodology, but yeah, I mean, we occasionally we get a sale. They're not very common, especially in the NFL, but um, it, I imagine those provide a pretty significant anchor to, you know, let's say the, the bills were sold for, you know, 5 billion. You're not going to say, well, then I mean, it would just like any other similar team. You have the Bengals right near them. You'd have to put, you know, probably they would be something in that range. Um, anyway, is so I imagine even though we don't get these team sales very often, they, they must have pretty significant weight when it comes to putting these numbers together. Yes. When team sales do happen, they obviously have an impact on the rest of the league as well. Uh, so you know, the commanders being sold for $6.05 billion last year bumped up all the teams ahead of them as well as all of the teams behind them, theoretically. Uh, you know, there's several factors that go into determining what a team may be worth. Things like market size and population and just how 
popular, I guess a team would be. They're all factored into, for example, obviously the Cowboys are one of, if not the most popular teams in the world. And that's why they're at the top of pretty much every list that we would come out with. Yeah. So yeah, and just, we were already starting to get into it, but I'm curious kind of what are the biggest factors for me? It seems like, you know, you've, you've the brand and, but also just, do you play in a major city? Like the giants and jets are are near the top of the list because they're in New York and they're not, they're not going anywhere. So that definitely helps, um, you know, playing in a bigger market, obviously you're going to have access to more of the local revenue. So things like ticket sales, merchandising, um, concessions, teams in larger markets can charge more for concessions because people generally make more money and they're more willing to spend in larger markets. Those are, I would say, the two biggest factors outside of you know what we look at to determine the values. Mm-hmm. And we have private equity is going to come into the league very soon and it's just been approved. Um, you know, firms can buy up to 10% of these teams. How, how much is that going to both change the actual values of the teams, but also like your ability to assess these values? Yeah. So we actually factored in the private equity coming into the league in the expectation that the vote would pass for this year's valuations. But it's hard to say exactly what kind of effect institutional investors will have on the values of teams without actually seeing what those limited stakes will ultimately be sold for. And being that it's such a low number, such a low percentage of of the stake that's allowed relative to the other leagues, it will be slightly less significant because like you said, it's, it's a, up to a 10% stake that's allowed. Whereas MLB, NBA, MLS, and NHL all allow up to 30% of a team to be held by private investors. And also that that 10% stake sale, it's just kind of a categorically different thing from a majority sale where obviously you get full control of the team and um, you know, it, it's just, you're, you're buying something different. Whereas like this is just like, a piece that a value that the firm hopes increases in value. And that's kind of the whole game. And so, um, you know, that might mean it's discounted. There might, they might factor in like the NFL's fee to some degree. It's, you won't be able to just say, you know, this is what 10% is worth. So this is what a hundred percent is worth. There's, there's always limited partner discounts. And especially if it's somebody that is already, or has been a part of the, franchise for a long time selling a a piece of the team there's always so many different factors that go into lp sales rather than controlling stake sales i'm wondering how you factor in or if you factor in things like so the buffalo bills are one building a new stadium two they're getting 850 million dollars of public money to do that um how much does the new stadium matter and how much does them getting almost a billion dollars dropped into their bank accounts matter so we do take the new stadium into account, uh, not not the real estate, the value of the real estate we don't take into account at all. So the fact that the stadium's was projected to be $1.2 billion and is ever growing, according to all the reports, uh, that value doesn't factor in to the ultimate value of the bills, but the fact that they're moving into a new building, they'll have increased ticket revenues, increased concession revenues, uh, likely higher naming rights revenues. All of those things are factored into how we est- establish their value. And the the Cowboys, I mean, they're they're kind of this unique entity in sports. So just looking at, you have a graph in in the the valuations article that shows just their progress. In 2013, they were valued as something like 2.3 billion. I want to say it's it's essentially quadrupled um, since just in the last 11 years. And the, we all know that these valuations they're going up every year. Um, you know, not for every single team, but generally the, the general picture is 
increasing. Um, but yeah, they're going up more than anyone else. The gap between them and the next highest team is increasing. You you already spoke to it a little bit, but what is is the story there in terms of how they have just completely like blasted out into space here? Yeah, so the the Cowboys stand out from the rest of the league because of as we mentioned in the article as well, uh, their immense local revenue generation and I'm almost tempted to put local in quotes because, as I mentioned, they're one of, if not the largest sport. So they have people flocking to AT&T Stadium from all over the world and in the process spending tons of money on team gear, tickets, concessions in the stadium, all those things helps just continuously to grow their their local revenue do you factor in things like if they own you know the grounds around the stadium and they have you know, hotels and restaurants that is you know are, are somehow making their way back into the the team's accounts does that count for for this for you as well no we we keep those separate uh so for example uh, jerry jones's star development in the surrounding areas that's all all of those revenues are kept separate from the team valuation. Uh, we we compile those in a separate list, our sports empires list that typically comes out at the beginning of the year. Yeah, but I guess if you're buying the Cowboys, you're not necessarily getting all that. If you, if you want that, that's that's extra. Right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And um, do, are there any other factors you see as potentially changing or turbocharging these values that you know could be coming down the line? Media is the largest factor, especially in terms of the NFL. Obviously, their national media deals have been public for the last couple of years, and they just seem to be continuously growing as the NFL tries to take over every day of the week. Um, so, you know, they're they're starting with this upcoming season, their Christmas Day games on Netflix, which will add forgot what the exact number is, but I believe it's around 120 to 150 million per Christmas Day game, which is just insane. They signed their 10 year media deals, 11 year media deals. And it's like, but they still can just like pull another 100, 200 million dollars out of their pockets, you know, right. every every year or two. Um, okay. Very interesting stuff. Really appreciate getting your insights. Justin Titlebaum, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Of course. Thank you for having me. The PGA Tour Championship kicked off yesterday with the biggest purse of any golf tournament ever played at $100 million. The first place prize of $25 million is up $7 million since last year's tournament. Second place will leave with $12.5 million and third place will be taking home $7.5 million. In fact, every golfer who is participating in the tournament is guaranteed to make a sizable paycheck, with the last place prize being $550,000. This comes on the heels of Commissioner Jay Monahan's update on the tour's proposed deal with Saudi Arabia's public investment fund, which backs Live Golf, a league notorious for its ludicrous player contracts. In a press conference ahead of the tour championship, Monahan said that there is no deadline in sight to reach a deal with the fund. He said, quote, I don't think we want to restrict ourselves in that way. We want to achieve the best and right outcome at the right time. With a $100 million purse, perhaps the PGA Tour won't be needing Saudi Arabia's money anytime soon. Steph Curry and the Warriors agreed on a one-year contract extension worth a whopping $62.5 million. This is the largest single-year salary in the history of American sports and thrusts Curry into an exclusive trio of players to earn $500 million on the court, joining LeBron James and Kevin Durant. Otani's contract is for $70 million per season, but $68 million of that per year is deferred. In the 2025-26 season, Steph Curry will earn more than the 2024 payrolls of the Oakland A's, every MLS team, the active payrolls of nine NHL teams last season, the total payrolls of every WNBA and NWSL team this year combined, and the 2023 GDP of Tuvalu. He pays to be the best shooter of all time. The sports world has been talking about new stadiums, luxury suites, and a controversial TikTok account. My colleague Daryl Barnes is fully plugged into what's causing all the chatter, and he joins us next. Joining me now is front office sports multimedia reporter, Daryl Barnes. Welcome, Daryl. Hey, how's it going, Owen? 
Great. Great to have it back on. So you are plugged into what's creating conversation buzz on social media. Uh, what's, what's the first big topic you have for us? So the first big topic is Northwestern's temporary Lakeside College Football Stadium. They're kicking off the seat in their first game tomorrow um, against Miami, Ohio. But this is basically, hey, Ryan Field's under construction. They had to find a temporary home. You know, Chicago had probably four other like suitable options that could have worked, um, but they were all kind of booked up or just too far. So they decided to build this temporary stadium on the Northwestern campus. So right on top of what was, you know, the soccer and lacrosse field. And then they basically brought in 12,000 temporary stadium seats. And it kind of just looked, it kind of just looks like this giant, you know, think of it like a giant premium high school football stadium that you would see like in Texas at the biggest schools. Right. And so it's a lot smaller, probably like almost a quarter of the size of, you know, what Ryan Field is while they're renovating that for two years. But then they're going to be playing games here for the next two season home games here on the lake looks kind of beautiful. I was there. They were telling me, hey, you know what? This is going to be really nice. Might be a little chilly around October hit or miss, but every the rest of the time it's going to be really exciting and kind of cool. It's a cool venue. Yeah, you know, it's that sounds not bad for a temporary stadium. I mean, they're doing better than uh than the Arizona Coyotes had for, you know, their <laughs> temporary then, you know, ended up ending their time there. Um but um all right. So, and I think you got another stadium topic for us. Yeah, yeah. So, now let's bring it to the big leagues, right? The NFL. The Arizona Cardinals um posted some photos recently of their casitas. These are their premium seating options and so they just unveiled these this week and they're kind of field level luxury seating options so they cost 26 to forty thousand dollars per game but you basically get like this two-story setup right along right kind of at field level and then and then you also get along with this is 20 parking tickets or 20 tickets total 10 parking passes and then a food and alcohol package all included in this and so it's like a two-story tiny home is sort of what they look like um and i'm <laughs> curious to know what your thoughts are on these i mean i'm looking at it now it does if you had a bed in there i'd be like yeah that's like a you know classy little studio apartment that just like apparently happens to be in a football stadium though the the seats in front are a little funny they're like a combination between just like a nice you know, like living room seat but it has a little like desk almost like the little attached desk to you know school i guess that's not meant for your notebook so much as like your beverage but um but yeah, yeah. that's we we posted this on Twitter and one of my favorite comments that I saw, which I just thought was funny, was fans, not all fans are seeming to love it. One guy said, so this is my basement, but with ferns for 30K. <laughs> also in like the little apartment zone, like there are a couple seats where you'd be looking out onto the field, but it doesn't really look like it's designed to actually watch the game. So you can like pay 40,000 yeah. bucks to like be next to a game. But yeah. only, you only watch it when you feel like it, I guess. Which, yeah, there's know, I guess. TVs inside of there. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Um, uh, last one. This one's a bit of a controversial one, I understand. Yeah, yeah. So the Paralympics held their opening ceremony on Wednesday. But the big thing, the big conversation around it has actually been their TikTok account. Um, our colleague Margaret Femling wrote like a cool feature on this on frontofficesports.com. But basically... They've been po taking a meme approach to posting clips of the Paralympics. Um, so, you know, that's like TikTok sounds like the what's this Picasso sound. Um, and they put that over things like a Paralympic, a Paralympic ping pong player, like who has no hands and uses his mouth and feet to, you know, compete in this match and that clip alone has 10 million views so a lot of disabled people obviously a lot of non-disabled people actually being the ones that have problems with this but craig spence the international paralympics committee's um chief brand and communications officer actually told front office sports it's okay to have a laugh with a person with a disability but he made the distinction he said now we laugh with them we don't laugh at them and there's a big difference in that but that seems to be the approach on tiktok um this year yeah i mean it's certainly you know doing the job and getting exposure and if it is truly a we're laughing with them thing 
then okay. Um, and if the only people getting offended are people not in the disabled community, then, then okay. Like, um, I just, yeah, <laughs> it, it's, it's a dicey one, I guess, but, I, but it seems like the Paralympics, you know, the U S Paralympic committee is like fully behind this. And I guess we haven't so far have not heard like uproar from the athletes or from the disabled community so much, but it's, it's definitely eye catching and there's like definitely a reason beyond just like the humor that this is getting so much attention yeah the athletes seem to be seem to be loving this too there's a couple other ones that are that are chiming in themselves posting their videos and have millions of followers now and so it's definitely going to be something that you'll see more of over the you know coming days as the paralympics really kick into full swing yeah all right daryl barnes thanks so much for joining us Thank you. Always good talking to you. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, please share it with a friend. We will be off Monday for Labor Day. Enjoy the long weekend. and We'll see you on Tuesday.